think we can probably get going here. So welcome to the last webinar of the Summer of Chameleon series. Um, if you were here two hours ago, hello again. Um, I'm going to start sharing the screen. So yeah, my name is Jason Anderson. Um, I work on the Chameleon Testbed. And uh, if you were here two hours ago, um, you saw me talk about Chia Edge, um, a new edge capability that we have on the, the testbed. And now I'm going to be talking about um, a little bit of a topic that it, it dovetails a little bit with the last webinar um, because we did demonstrate some of these uh, reproducibility oriented capabilities of Chameleon. Uh, but the, this webinar really is more of a deep dive into everything that we have, uh, why, why we built it, and what problems we think it solves, and also um, maybe introducing some pretty powerful like new ideas around an open reproducibility platform um, that we are aiming to build with a um, service and product that we call Trovi. So uh, pretty cool stuff, and we've got some stuff to cover, so let's just get down to it. So I think that um, to sort of set the stage here, one of the issues that we're trying to address is uh, can be thought of as a dilemma, the reproducibility dilemma, where as a uh, researcher, you're often presented with this choice of how to spend time given that you have such um, a precious, precious little amount of it, you can either spend the time to take your work and really um, sort of dress it up, put a bow on it, make sure it's a really nice, clean, reproducible artifact, which takes time, or you can use that time to do new research at the cost of you know, making it so that it's harder for people to pick up uh, your stuff, that you worked on before, and also at the cost that it's maybe harder for you to return to it later. And so what we're trying to do um, as operators of research infrastructure in Chameleon is sort of collapse this choice a bit such that you as the user, as the researcher, have um, a lot more options and, a, and um, a better ability to easily package your experiment effectively, such that this is not so much of a, of a choice that you have to make. Um, and to, to go into that, um, well, before we sort of talk about what solutions we have, I think it's important to define terms a little bit more, um, a little bit more carefully, because reproducibility means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So the title of this webinar is, refers to practical reproducibility. And when we say this, what we mean is it's packaging experiments such that they can be repeated in a cost-effective manner. And really the important thing there is um, cost-effective. So you can imagine that if you had like true ideal reproducibility, you would be able to take some research that somebody did like five years ago and be able to reproduce the exact same experiment set up the exact same machine, hardware versions, firmware, uh, plugged into a certain networking topology. You can think that like, in theory, this is, is possible, um, but it would be incredibly expensive to, to do, to figure out how to really accurately um, reproduce that environment, especially after such a long time. So the idea of cost-effective reproducibility is, you know, introduces the idea of like, well, really, how important is that to do um, in, in our field of, of computer science research? It seems that um, the most you know, effective uh, window of time in which um, reproducibility is important is about you know, one year after you've done the work, mostly for artifact review and so that you can iterate on it and do something else with it. And so this is kind of like the, the window that we're, we're using, um, we're loosening uh, the constraints a little bit on reproducibility. And when we do this, it really enables us to uh, solve the problem in um, 
a much more cost-effective way. So uh, moving forward from that, so um, the other sort of aspect about reproducibility that is a little bit difficult is that there are many different dimensions uh, to, to like to a well a well constructed reproducibility artifact. Let's say um, we can think of it as like a little bit of this. You have all these different elements that need to be sort of um, unified into a whole picture. So first of all, we need a well documented process for the experiment. So it's not just enough to say like I. I have this experiment um, and this is like the code you run, here it is. But you also want to talk about like, well, why did I set things up this way? How am I connecting these two machines together? Um, so really talking about the reasoning about why the experiment was set up the way that it was, um, as opposed to just the code. However, the code is very important. You want to actually be able to do something. So executable code, in addition to um, the process is sort of um, very useful. Then we have the uh, problem where even if you have a really well-defined reproducibility artifact, you, it's not really useful if nobody can find it. So you want to be able to put the artifact somewhere um, such that it can be easy for others to discover it, perhaps such that it can be easy to reference from a paper. And then lastly, um, the aspect that I think most often people talk about when they talk about reproducibility um, is that you have a consistent and accessible environment in which to run the experiment. And for, for our research, for computer science, this is a little bit trickier because it's not just about like um, fulfilling software requirements, but it's actually about fulfilling specific, maybe specific hardware, custom kernel, uh, specific networking constraints and topology. Uh, this is uh, quite difficult for computer science uh, research. And um, because it's difficult, this is one of the challenges of reproducing work. We want to make this as easy as possible for the person who comes after, so they don't need to slog through that task. So fortunately, uh, without us, Chameleon, doing really anything, there's a lot of stuff that has been contributed that we can leverage. So when I was talking about well-documented process and executable code, uh, if you imagine like what do those two things look like interleaved, a lot of you are probably familiar with Jupyter Notebooks and maybe that even sort of, uh, you thought, oh, that sounds like a notebook. Yes, uh, this is a great tool for blending these two concepts. It enables you to demonstrate your idea, but also allow you to execute the code. Um, on the left-hand side, um, we've got the uh, ability to um, share now these art reproducibility artifacts to services such as Zenodo. If you're not familiar with Zenodo, it is a nice um, sort of online artifact store where you can upload really a, um, a wide variety of data and it assigns digital object identifiers. It can be cited. Uh, and it is backed by CERN for long-term storage and has some pretty decent indexing capabilities as well. So this is really helps to organize and store artifacts for citation and finding later. Lastly, uh, open test beds, Chameleon being one of them, others uh, might include uh, Jetstream or Cloud Lab, but really you can even consider Commercial clouds are a type of open test bed, given that they have open access and a relatively uh, stable amount of hardware. So this allows you to reproduce some experiment on an exact hardware software configuration. For test beds like Chameleon and Cloud Lab, you can actually be really precise and get exactly the same machine as you did before. Uh, commercial clouds, they don't really uh, give you this capability but you can still express some experiments um, like that. So we have the picture is not quite filled in. And so one thing to think about is like, well, like what, what can we imagine that would be a nice a way that, that this could work? And so you could imagine that as a, as a researcher, it would be cool if I could just, without having to install anything on my machine, 
I could log in to some sort of interactive environment where I can use notebooks. I can do all the, um, the things that I would normally want to do with my experiment. Um, I can actually use my, my notebook or use this environment to request resources on the open test bed, to request servers, to connect them together with links of, of various speeds, to provision them with disk images, to install software on them. Um, ideally, all kind of from, from one vantage point uh, within the Jupyter environment. And then I could also use something like a Jupyter notebook to like drive the experiment, to sort of set up a data collection uh, thing process here, to then sort of inject some, uh, some additional configuration and start some, some traffic or some process over here, and then to start collecting data and um, analyzing it inside the notebook such that we can output it for, for publishing. The really nice part about that would be now somebody who comes in later, they're actually just able to execute your experiment um, just more or less top down, recreating the entire environment, setting up the environment, and then executing your experiment and uh, analyzing the results all within one thing. That really makes it easy later for you or somebody else from your group, somebody else um, across the world who wants to build on your work to open that maybe tweak a few different things. Maybe they try a different approach. Maybe they're trying to compare uh, their approach to your approach and generate the same type of, 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 um, of diagram of output of visualization um, for really nice, easy comparison. And you can also imagine that not just for comparing the results of an actual experiment of, of a variation on the experiment, but also very, I mean, this, this workflow is very uh, directly translates to artifact review and also can just be used for uh, providing a springboard. So you look at something and somebody's done something cool. Um, you kind of are going to do something quite different, but maybe borrowing some of the ideas, some of the setup, uh, some of the patterns, and you can do something new with that. So that's kind of the general like vision of what we think uh, is cool and interesting to, to, to target. And so now we can talk about like what do we have what's the current state of um, options available to you on chameleon and uh, this is going to be centered around a, a like i said a product slash service that we call trovi which is like a an open practical reproducibility system uh, and so trovi really kind of sits in the uh, the middle part of this picture because what Trovi does is it allows you to um, connect a repository of research artifacts and instantiate them onto something like an open test bed. And it's able to do this via a, um, a bit of like a, a plugin ecosystem that allows you to bring artifacts into Trovi from various sources and then um, sort of inject artifacts or instantiate them or replay them or however um, onto things like open test beds, but also clouds or even just your own like a, own local machine. And so it's really intending to sort of close the loop here. Um, it integrates with things like Sonodo to allow you to um, not just sort of work on uh, experiments sort of privately or iterating on things, but then when you're ready, you can actually promote them to Zenodo for long-term storage for citation and so on and so forth. And what this looks like at a, a high level is we have a, um, a pretty nice integration with Jupyter itself where you can take any directory of uh, files that represents an artifact and i'll talk about like what is an artifact uh, shortly and it will then package that and store it into this um, trovi system which is a basically a tagged collection of um, of these artifact blobs so it contains the contents of the files but you can also describe a bit more about uh, what it is what's the experiment you can list multiple authors uh, importantly 
you can also create multiple versions of the same artifact. So as you're working on something, you can make changes, you can publish a new version, um, you can delete versions, you can do a lot of different things. And um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show you some of those things in just a second. Before we uh, talk a little bit more, I just want to talk about what I've used the word artifact a lot. Again, this is something that could use additional uh, refinement in its definition. So when we talk about an artifact, what we're talking about is a relatively lightweight, um, you know, tarball, basically. It's just a collection of files and folder structure. And usually it's representing a mixture of code and documentation. Um, and usually for, for most utility, it will have at least one Jupyter notebook, but it could have uh, many. So there's really not a lot of assumptions made on like what an artifact is. It's a little bit uh, intentionally loose. Some things that are useful to include are examples of, of input and output um, that can really go a long way in helping people navigating your artifact if they don't have you know, all the context on, on your research. Other things you might want to include um, if you need like a, a custom, you have some like custom way that you're building like a, a kernel module or something and you have instructions on how to do that, very useful. Uh, if you have some really special configuration files that are required, so useful to include. Um, one thing that um, is not included when we talk about artifacts are really large amounts of data. So if you're working with um, big data sets, if you're even like disk images that have a lot of software installed, um, that's not something that Trovi is going to be sort of ingesting and disseminating. Um, the reason for that is that Trovi is designed to be kind of an open system that can be integrated with a large variety of uh, open infrastructure. As such, if it was centrally storing all of these like large data sets, it kind of is not that useful because in order to use the data set, you're gonna to need to copy them to your target infrastructure anyway. So um, part of what Trovi does support though, is the idea where um, you could associate your artifacts, say like, hey, here's, here's this code I have, um, it will run on Chameleon and by the way, I've also published a disk image separately to Chameleon. And if you use that disk image in conjunction with the notebook, um, you know, I assert that you will get the output that I've described in my paper. So you can link your artifact to external entities like this. This is pretty early, early support. We haven't done a lot of stuff with this yet. I mostly mention it because um, you know, you're, you're not going to be storing tons of data in Trovi itself. That's not how it's designed. Okay, so um, I sort of showed a little bit of the, you saw a little GIF of the Jupyter integration. Just to explain a little bit more about why this is a bit uh, special. So normally, maybe many of you have worked with Jupyter notebooks already, and you've probably used them for doing things like uh, data science, crunching, crunching numbers, uh, doing some heavy analysis. If you've worked uh, in an HPC environment, sometimes they have nice plugins that allow you to start big um, like Dask jobs or batch schedule jobs and get the get data back. It's a very flexible tool. It's kind of a front end to a computation. So for our Jupyter integration for Chameleon, because um, computer science researchers, you all, are largely configuring your own cloud environment in which you're going to be executing your experiment. Um, Jupyter notebooks for Chameleon users are um, really function well to, to drive the sort of orchestration of your experiment environment and then the steps taken inside that environment. So you can take a code cell and use it to actually call um, to, to basically ask Chameleon to do stuff for you. So like, hey, make me a reservation for this type of node, uh, give me an instance act by this image, um, set my security group to X, Y, Z. You can do all of this um, really easily from within the notebook uh, because it's when you, you basically log into this environment with your Chameleon account and 
by, by virtue of doing that, it sort of understands your, your user session. And a lot of the complexity of interacting with the test bed via CLI or via um, Python APIs, if you've tried to do this, a lot of those complexities disappear because you don't need to deal with any of the authentication problems. Um, it's all, it understands your session. It's able to perform actions on the test bed as if um, you were performing them yourself via the GUI or something. But you can also do more than that. You can, um, uh, we have some examples where you can actually trigger uh, jobs remotely. You can, SS, you can do like one-off SSH, running scripts to install files, running scripts to um, start your experiments process going. So you can do a lot of stuff with this. The important part is it enables you to document what the steps are and also uh, capture data, whether that's, you know, SCP and data back from the remote to your uh, local environment. There's a lot of things you can do here. And I'm gonna show you that and also just um, give you a little bit more of a run through of how to use Trovi uh, right now. So let me exit out of that. And so um, if you uh, are, are new in, to Chameleon and have not been here, you can go to uh, the experiment section at the top and there's this Trovi button, which will take you to a view that will probably look a little bit like this. Um, you won't see everything here because I have some artifacts that I've published that are private to me. And so I will see those, but I'll also see ones that have been publicly uh, published for all Chameleon users. And we have some artifacts in here that are sort of not really research artifacts. They're more intended as, as guides, as maybe templates for different types of experiments, such as uh, this edge to cloud uh, template, which really covers like using our edge test bed, which I just presented um, a little bit ago, but also our one of Chameleon's either KVM or bare metal test beds. You can basically connect to both of them request some, request some uh, resources be provisioned and then exchange traffic between the two to do some interesting edge to cloud experiments. And this is kind of a general template that you can follow um, and, and launch on Chameleon and play around with. So there's stuff like that, which is public. Um, we also have some public, uh, public experiments that have been like reproduced and packaged that you can take a look at as examples. One other kind of like fun thing we do with, with Trovi is, uh, you know, we sort of track like how many folks have uh, looked at a particular version of your experiment who have like, who've opened it on the, the test bed. Um, and we're able to sort of do more types of uh, interesting things with understanding like how people are using your, your artifacts. And as I mentioned before, you can have uh, private artifacts in this case, I've got one that I'm going to show uh, in a bit of that I just published from Jupiter to get here. And um, it's only something that is visible to me. Uh, this is nice because I can like work on something privately and it, I can sort of use it to save my work at various stages. Like, okay, I've, I've gotten to a certain point. Now I kind of commit my experiment and I can you know roll back and see a different, go back to a different version if I want to as well. So um, the, the other side of this is um, the Jupiter side. And the easiest way to get to the Jupiter side, excuse me, is to go to jupiter.chameleoncloud.org. If you are a um, Chameleon user that is associated with an active allocation, you should see something like this when you log in. Um, if you are not part of an allocation, uh, you're not able to access the environment because it works similarly to the, the rest of the cloud and infrastructure. You, you just have to be on an allocation in order to, in order to, to use it. So um, yeah, if you're interested then um, in any of the Chameleon stuff, then you should try to find a PI or if you are a PI, you should request a, a project. So when, I, when we go to, if you just go to the Jupyter environment, you'll kind of open up into this default, what I call like the workbench. And this is a, an environment that will always be sort of ready there for you. 
Um, this, all this stuff is like folders that I've made over um, various points in time. And it's there to kind of serve as your, yeah, like I said, your workbench. You can create new experiments here um, and you can, from here, then once you have something that you like, you can save it as a new artifact. And so I'm just gonna show how that works. So I've got this thing here. To be honest, I don't even remember what this is, <laughs> but I'm going to package it as a new artifact. It's called instance launch failures. So I'll say instance launch failures. Um, short description is required. I uh, don't know what this is anymore. <laughs> and uh, I think I'm gonna put in, I'll put in my name and affiliation. I believe that is optional, but um, pretty quick. It just, what happened just now was it uh, zipped up that file, that folder directory, packaged it and published it to Trovi. And so now um, if I go back to Trovi, ah, here it is, instance launch failures. So um, I was able to really quickly sort of, you know, publish, uh, publish this here. Now, the cool part about this is um, I can share it with, with other people. So once it's in Trovi, like one of the limitations of just having a Jupyter environment is it's a bit difficult to share stuff with other people. Um, maybe you've experienced this before. Uh, certain products like Google Colab do this really well because it has a, you know, a massive understanding of a, you know, everybody's basically on the Google file system. So you can just, you know, share stuff. Uh, this kind of functions in a similar way. By putting it into Trovi, you kind of um, put it into, yes, kind of like a shared uh, access structure. And what this allows me to do is if I click uh, share on here, a lot of different options for ways that I can give this to other people. Uh, one option is I could just say, yep, I'm okay with actually any chameleon user should be able to, to find this and, uh, and launch it. Um, or by default, what you can do is take a private link like this, and then, oops. So I'm just opening up an incognito window. Actually, I don't know if you're gonna see that because I'm only sharing one Firefox window. But um, if you open this, basically, if you're, anybody can take this link and open it and it'll resolve for them even if they uh, wouldn't otherwise have access to that experiment. Um, and this is important because in particular, it can allow for interesting uh, possibilities around artifact review. So if you are um, submitting a paper, you can have your artifact. You don't want to maybe publish it uh, uh, for citation or anything just yet. Um, you, can do, you can do this thing called um, enable reproducibility requests. And this sort of turns on a capability that we call chameleon day pass. Um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. Uh, all this, well, all this, um, what this does is it allows people to come to that link. And even if they are not um, on a chameleon allocation, they can request a day pass from the PI of your project. Uh, requesting a day pass, the PI can then accept it and say like, yes, this person, I was expecting them to come in and, and be interested. Uh, they can, I will give them a few hours of, of allocation to play around and reproduce the, the, uh, the artifact. So this is really nice. Um, it, you can also use it to share it with collaborators or really anybody that um, is interested in reproducing your work. It's helpful for those who don't have an easier path onboarding into a chameleon allocation, but still want to check out your work. So that's a really important feature. And again, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in detail in just a bit. Um, but yeah, but the important part was that now that it's in Trovi, um, I have the ability to share access to it in a lot of different ways. Now, um, and as you can see as well, like when, when I did that, this little uh, folder like is now green, it's sort of lit up. And that's just indicating that um, this actually represents uh, an artifact now that I know about. So you can, from here, you can edit the artifact and importantly, if you ever make changes, you can create a new version um, and just take whatever the current contents are and zip it up. 
Uh, I don't think, let's see, you know, maybe I need to change a little thing here. Just like that. And I'll create new version. Cool. Now, if I go back, should see two versions and there we go. So you see the second version was uh, another one that was created today um, later on. So uh, that's pretty cool. Now, now I want to show how do you actually, uh, from the other side, like, like what happens when you launch one of these things? So let's go back. Um, I have, so here's one example that somebody has published a JVM garbage collection performance benchmark. And it's like, oh, maybe I'm interested in seeing what this is all about. I can just click uh, launch on Chameleon. And what this would do um, is it'll actually open up a new server environment that just has the contents of that artifact in it. And so here um, I can see that uh, this person, they have a notebook um, that has the experiment. Um, this is really nice. They've talked about all the different things that are, are necessary that you need to do to, to reproduce the work. And it looks like, yep, here's the, the figures that it's eventually going to be um, producing. And so I can take like a, something like this and I can go through and try to uh, reproduce it and maybe change some aspects of it according to, according to my needs. Maybe I wanna uh, create a different visualization um, or maybe I want to vary some of like what these scripts are doing. I'm not sure, but we'll see. The nice part is from here, I can actually package this as a new artifact. So I can take this person's work. I can, you know, make, make a bunch of changes. Maybe I can vary it in some way. And I can say, this is a modified JVM benchmark. Um, Jason's edit. And let's see if it'll let me do that without putting in authors this time. Yep, okay. Now, so yeah, I can see that here's my modified JVM benchmark. And now this one is, you know, this one's only owned by me. So this is a new artifact, something that basically I forked from this one. And so this allows you to take somebody else's work and really build on it in interesting ways. Now, uh, the other sort of main thing I wanted to show regarding this, so we can have enough time here, is that there's multiple ways, not just through Jupyter, that you can get artifacts into here. Another way is you can actually associate the artifact uh, with a Git repository. Um, and this is also pretty flexible in how it works. So here's my, um, I have some, some Git repo that is packaging up some, uh, some application configuration. As you can see, I've already got, um, it understands that, you know, currently I have some uh, revision that is stored here in this version. And so if I want, I can actually just tell me like, yeah, you can actually get this from Git if you want. Um, you can also just download the files directly from here. You can launch it on Chameleon like I just showed. And if I edit this from here, I can also create a new version from Git. And so um, this is the Git repository that I'm going to use. And um, I'm just gonna use the, it actually will detect any like branches or tags you've got there if you, if you wanna do it that way. And I'm gonna tell it, yeah, I, I pushed some commits here. So just use like, uh, use the main, the main tip of the main branch. And boom, it just sort of uh, took that. And now I have a new version corresponding to my uh, new changes that I made to that Git repository. And you know I can go back and forth uh, between the two if I want to check it out at an earlier version or a later version. And you can see the hashes differed a little bit. Unfortunately, they both start with two. So it kind of looked like it was the same one. But I assert they were different. Okay, um, so that's like an overview of a lot of the different things you can do on Trovi, uh, both as a user who's interested in 
taken somebody's work and you know checking it out on Chameleon, but also just you know using Trovi as a way of catalog cataloging, uh, cataloging, storing, and sharing your own research. And let me uh, go back here and get through uh, the rest of this and remember what I'm going to be talking about next. Yes. <laughs> so the one thing I also wanted to talk about, um, I'm not going to maybe go over this in too much detail because we're going to share the slides, but um, in the process of sort of figuring out uh, what makes a nice reproducible artifact, we came up with some um, interesting guidelines that might be useful might be useful for you in your own work, basically about uh, thinking about the person coming into your artifact, what can you do to make it so they understand more about like, what is your research? What should they expect? Um, and making their life uh, easier. So I talked a little bit about this before, uh, Chameleon Day Pass is a really nice feature. Um, this is this little thing shows you kind of what it looks like. If you are somebody who is not logged in, who doesn't have an allocation or anything, when you go to a, an artifact via a private link or however, that has day pass enabled, um, instead of that launch button, you get a request day pass button. And when you do that, you sort of say like, you give a little reason like, um, hey, I am from such and such, you know, maybe artifact review, I'd like to review this for, um, ACM badge, you know, acceptance or whatever. And then the PI of the project that you can designate a, a project that kind of owns the artifact and the PI of that project can then, um, has the ability to approve or reject the request, you know, in case it's somebody who just is trying to, to get free cycles on Chameleon and you don't know who they are, you can reject them. But most of the time, uh, you know, we, we would hope that the person asking is actually interested in, in your research and you can accept their request. What this will do is um, it'll basically grant them a really short-term allocation that allows them to, um, for however long as, as you've specified, like however long your experiment takes to reproduce, they'll have access to Chameleon for that long and they should be able to go through and um, uh, reproduce your experiment. So that's a pretty nice feature um, that is provided uh, by Chameleon's integration with Trovi. And, but Chameleon's integration with Trovi is, um, you know, a lot of what, what I was showing, but one of the sort of cool things about Trovi is that it's actually a standalone system and it can be integrated into a wide variety of uh, sort of test beds and front end clients and um, all kinds of things that we're interested to see um, what becomes possible with this over time. So there is an open API. You can check it out um, on, we have Trovi documentation, which I think is linked at the end of this presentation. But uh, there are many ways in which you can extend Trovi. So like right now, um, authentication works by effectively piggybacking off of a Chameleon session. So if you're logged into Chameleon, you, are, you can be logged into Trovi. Um, a similar, uh, this is sort of how authentication with Trovi works. And we are working with Fabric. If you know the Fabric testbed, we're working with them to be the, the second um, session identity provider so that any Fabric user will be able to, to use Trovi to um, publish Fabric artifacts or to maybe launch Chameleon artifacts on Fabric to whatever extent that makes sense. So that's one way that Trovi is flexible. The other way is, or one of the other ways is where the artifacts are ultimately stored. So I showed that you know when, when you're in our Jupyter environment, Chameleon's Jupyter environment, you're actually ultimately saving the data to the Chameleon object store. So that's one backend uh, we can support. Um, you know other object stores in the future, like S3 or um, whatever. The uh, Zenodo is another backend I mentioned. So like we we have the ability to sort of upload to Zenodo uh, for you and ultimately storing the artifact there for a better long-term storage and citation. And I demonstrated that Git can also sort of act as a storage backend where uh, Trovi is kind of, can, can point to a Git repository and you can share a Trovi link. Um, it'll manage all of like the, the checking out and cloning and whatever you need to do uh, to get the Git contents 
into a nice environment for the user to play around with. Uh, various front end applications can possibly integrate with Trovi. Like right now, we've uh, integrated, written two integrations. One is a sort of general purpose JupyterLab integration, um, which is open source, but it still has some, I think it has a, a few assumptions still about being a little bit tied to Chameleon, um, but it is open source, you can find it. Uh, it's called Jupyter Lab Chameleon, and it has our stuff in there. And then Chameleon's user portal also has a pretty tight integration. And that's what I was showing when I was like, you know, going down the list and, um, you know, opening an artifact, getting a share link, all of that is powered by this public API that is completely independent to Chameleon. And so you can imagine other applications could integrate with Trovi to provide their own browsing experiences, their own, um, you know, kind of whatever you, you want to do. If you don't want to um, use the Chameleon GUI, you can write your own. And uh, lastly, testbed integrations. It's a really interesting one. Uh, right now, Trovi kind of has a relatively loose integration with Chameleon, actually. Um, it mostly is just uh, storing artifacts, and then uh, you can open them, and then you can, the artifact contains instructions on how to um, basically request assets on Chameleon. But uh, one thing that I think it's interesting to think about is over time, like what if the artifacts could just automatically just be like you open an artifact and the process of opening an artifact creates the environment on the target test bed. So I don't have to go through the process of, you know, individually spinning up the servers and configuring them. Like that can all be self-contained as like part of the, the transaction of, of launching the experiment. It's a bit more of like a, wouldn't it be cool, North Star thing, but um, this is just part of what Trovi makes possible. So we're pretty uh, excited about Trovi. Um, if you are in the position of uh, integrating Trovi or maybe suggesting it, if you would like it um, integrated at your uh, institution or somehow else, then definitely let us know. You can also check out the Trovi documentation at that link. Um, that, that link is mostly meant for people who are interested in integrating with Trovi. If you're interested more in just in, in using it, the Chameleon documentation and some of our other videos and webinars are probably uh, still the best asset for that. And I think that that is everything that I wanted to cover regarding uh, reproducibility. Uh, hopefully you have a better idea about all the various things available to you in Chameleon. I do encourage, um, there is a, if you go to the Chameleon Cloud YouTube channel, there is a playlist um, of various students who have used Trovi and Chameleon to package and reproduce either um, other experiments or their own experiments. Um, they're describing like their experiment, how they packaged it and um, what they you know liked or didn't like about that. And you can check that out. Um, like one of them, I believe, is like the seeing like, well, how do we package like the AlexNet experiments? And so you can just pull in the data set and then perform uh, the analysis and generate a nice like paper graphic. So kind of a, showing like an end-to-end -end example of how you can use it to do something a little bit more complicated. So definitely suggest checking that out. Uh, again, our other webinars um, are hopefully helpful uh, about this topic. And otherwise, yeah, I would just say, if you're interested, try playing around with it. Um, with, these, with these tools, in particular Jupyter Notebooks, oftentimes, you know, maybe if you're skeptical about the value, the value is kind of proven like down the road. <laughs> so like you spend a little bit of time like, oh, this is a little bit inconvenient. I have to like, you know, put stuff into this like code cell instead of just writing it from my command line. But then um, oftentimes somebody reproducing your work is yourself later. So you come back after like a month um, and you're like, oh, I completely forgot what I was doing. The nice part is that Jupyter Notebooks can kind of serve as a uh, fallback lab notebook that yeah, you've already sort of had to go through the process of writing everything down and now it's there and now you can just follow it again. So that's, again, speaks to the power of um, notebooks as a really nice tool for um, sort of expressing an experiment that can be replayed 
uh, in a practical way. And yeah, I've definitely talked for long enough now. I'm gonna open it up in case there are any questions. We've got about 13 minutes left. Um, it's been a bit of a quieter crowd in the past, so you know, no pressure, but if anybody has anything that they're curious about, more than happy to, to answer. And this is the part where we should have the, uh, the Jeopardy music playing. So no immediate questions, that is cool. Um, you can, if you're curious about any of this stuff, you can always write to us at um, contact or help at chameleoncloud.org. Um, again, our documentation is pretty thorough and um, reproducibility stuff is no exception. So check that out if you're interested and yeah, have fun. I guess that means that this concludes our uh, Summer of Chameleon Webinar series. <laughs>